Welcome to or welcome back to our channel and thank you for joining me here again today. So for today's case, we are still going to talk about a South African, but not necessarily a South African in South Africa. So today we are going to follow the journey of a young married couple and how things slowly started to turn quite tragic. But just before we jump into today's case, last week we spoke about the Tanya Flower Day case and how there was potentially a snuff film out there about her death and how this video could be somewhere out there in the dark web. But that's enough admin from me for one day and let's get into today's case. Intended for mature audiences only. Melanie van der Maver was born in Pretoria, South Africa. And from a very young age, Melanie really wanted to move to the UK. She loved the life over there and she loved the look and potential of what she could particularly have. So immediately, once Melanie finished high school, she jumped into work and she started saving as much as she could in order to build up enough money to pay for a flight to move overseas. And hard work and determination paid off for Melanie because in 1996, she saved enough money up to travel to London. And basically, as soon as she landed, she went looking for jobs in London and she ended up working as a waitress in one of the hotels. Melanie was very determined to make her life successful and she was strong-willed and she was dedicated to getting as much money as she could to send home and also to be comfortable in her new foreign country. So Melanie was very strong-willed and she was willing to take charge of any situation in order to get things done and in order to just kind of have control over the situation as well. And before long, Melanie started off as a waitress, but she started building up and building up, eventually got quite highly ranked within the hotel industry. And she eventually ended up becoming a food and beverage manager within one of these prestigious hotels. And if we just step back and talk about who Melanie was, she was very much liked by a lot of people back home in South Africa. And she she was said to have a very contagious smile. Her dad, Petrus van der Maver, said that she was always laughing. She always had a big smile on her face and people knew and could hear her coming from just how jovial she was and just how much laughter and life she would bring into the room. And while working in the UK, Melanie actually ended up meeting a man named Peter and they ended up meeting because Peter worked in the same hotel that she did. And this was in the Marriott Regents Park in Northwest London. So let's talk a little bit about Peter. So Peter Wallner was born in Germany and he was an only child who grew up in a very small village in Germany. After high school, Peter trained to become a chef and eventually Peter worked his way up to work at a very prestigious Four Seasons Hotel in Munich. And once he got all of his qualifications and he had all this background working at the Four Seasons, he then joined the German army where he worked as a paramedic for three years before returning back to Germany to work as a chef again. But people would describe Peter as a very high pressured person in the sense that he loves everything, high pressure, fast paced. He wanted that kind of lifestyle where he constantly had something to do and something to keep him busy. And working in these very prestigious kitchens kind of subdued Peter's appetite for this fast paced life because it was constant buzzing in the kitchen. There was constant high pressure, people shouting at you. It's hot, it's sweaty. And he loved that kind of environment. And Peter was described as a very good chef. He was very good at his job and he worked back in Munich for two years. But then he decided to emigrate to England England in 2000 and before long with his time working in London he eventually got quite a good reputation as a very very good chef in London and people would describe him as being able to work very well under pressure without even breaking a sweat like the people on his team in the kitchen would notice that he would be very direct and he would never seem to flinch with any emotion he would just stare at the food get his job done very well basically so Melanie and Peter got into a relationship quite quickly and quite soon after they met and they ended up getting married about a year after they first met and as soon as they were married, they then purchased a home in Hammersmith. So with a new home, a new marriage, they wanted to focus on their career as well because they both wanted to be very successful people. So Melanie then worked in the catering department in the House of Commons and Peter was still a very well-known and very regarded chef in London. And Peter was seen as a rising star in the chef industry and he was becoming very celebrity-like between other chefs. And from everyone else looking in, Peter and Melanie seem to be a very happy and very successful couple. So with all couples, they all end up fighting. And with some couples, their parents-in-law don't really enjoy them. And that's kind of the problem that happened with Melanie and Peter. Because Melanie's parents didn't really find Peter that charming. And while Peter and Melanie were kind of navigating through their first year of marriage, Melanie's parents really thought that she was quite naive in love. And they were a bit disappointed that Melanie didn't really go on more dates before she ended up marrying 
marrying this man because they thought that this was the first man that fell in love, the first man that gave her attention and she ended up marrying him and they really wanted her to explore love, to explore everything and they also thought that Peter wasn't really the right person for her and Melanie's parents actually believed that Melanie only married Peter for his green card because Peter was a German or European passport holder which meant that she could then marry into that and then be able to stay in the EU or in the UK for longer. But with everyone on the outside looking in you don't really know what happens behind closed doors and Melanie was really really in love with Peter and later on police would find her diary and she would write snippets in her diary about how much she loved him and how she couldn't believe that he was the person who was giving her all his attention and how she got so lucky. But sadly this amount and a lot of love that Melanie was pouring onto Peter he didn't exactly feel the same way. She would often say that he was very, very precise and he wanted everything a certain way. And this could just be his personality. Maybe she didn't really know him long enough to see how he liked everything in a certain way. But Peter would often become petty most times and he would say that Melanie was spending unnecessary money on shampoo and he would say that that is a waste of money. You don't need to wash your hair with these expensive shampoos. But like I said, this could probably just be his personality type. But even though Melanie and Peter were having these arguments and he was telling her petty things like shampoo is too expensive, Melanie wasn't really one to sit down and take it, even though she really loved Peter and she was disappointed that he didn't show her the affection that she felt that she deserved. She wasn't going to sit down and let him talk to her the way that he did. And Melanie would try and stand up for herself and she would constantly tell Peter how she's feeling. But as soon as she would stand up and talk and say how she's feeling, Peter would just kind of brush her off and not even listen. He would completely ignore her, walk away or just do something else, put on the TV and completely ignore everything that she was trying to tell him. And Melanie was incredibly in love with Peter and she really wanted to try and make things work. And Melanie was looking at ways to improve their marriage and she thought, Thought that because she's hearing all this talk about her mom and dad saying that she needed to be more experienced before meeting Peter, she kind of had this in her head that she wasn't experienced enough for Peter. So she bought books about sex and she wanted to learn different ways to please her husband. And she said that she just wanted to become a more desirable lover for her husband and that he would be happy in the bedroom. So we skip forward a few years and Peter and Melanie are still together, but they decide that they've had enough of the city life and they now want to move out of the city and kind of into the suburb, kind of into the country. So we on the border, but they really liked the area of Surrey and they thought that this was a perfect place that they could maybe start a family in Melanie's head. I don't know if Peter was quite there with the family yet, but Peter eventually got a job at the Woodland Park Hotel and Melanie also got a job at the Woodland Park Hotel as the catering manager as well. So the couple ended up renting a home because they weren't quite sure where they wanted to stay yet, but they ended up renting a home in a place called Hamilton Avenue in Cobham. And this place that they were renting wasn't quite far from work and the couple seemed quite happy in their new adventure and their new home. But beneath the surface, something was definitely brewing. And just when Melanie and Peter started working at the Woodland Park Hotel, an exchange student also started working at the same hotel. And her name was Lilia Finench. And as soon as Peter laid his eyes on Lilia, he thought that she was absolutely stunning, absolutely beautiful, and he definitely wanted this young lady. And before long, Melanie actually discovered that Lilia and Peter were having a full-blown affair. And Melanie was absolutely heartbroken by this because she was hearing rumors from people in the hotel and she eventually confronted Peter and he admitted that they were having an affair. And she was heartbroken, but she really wanted to try and make things work with Peter because she was in love with him. But one of the conditions that she wanted from Peter in trying to make the marriage work was that they had to go to couples counseling together, which they did. But the counselor said to Melanie that maybe working at the same hotel is not the best idea you go home together you at work together you never have a break from each other and you're also working in the same kind of industry he's a chef and she's a catering manager so there's no break by separating each other from the hotel either. So Melanie eventually left the Woodland Park Hotel and she then got a job in Kensington Gardens at the Thistle Hotel. And Lilia was still working at the Woodland Park Hotel with Peter and there weren't any articles to say that they had stopped their affair after Melanie left. But however, that did end because Lilia ended up going back to her home country in Malta. And Peter did tell Melanie that she left and she was no longer in the country. But Melanie was kind of hopeful that, okay, she's gone. There's no more temptation. Hopefully Peter can just focus on me now. But things still weren't working very well at home. They ended up sleeping in separate beds but Melanie was still optimistic that things would work. But even though Lilia had gone back to Malta, 
Peter was already on to the next best thing and he was now on to another young lady named Emma and Emma Harrison worked at Woodlands Park Hotel as a wedding planner and Peter and Emma were incredibly obvious about their relationship. They were having PDA sessions in the middle of a ballroom while other people were trying to work there and they would just kiss and fondle each other in public and they would also wander off to dark rooms and it was pretty obvious to the people who were working there what was happening and obviously they knew that Peter had a wife because she was was working there a couple months before but Melanie continued to just focus on their relationship and she just wanted to make sure that she and Peter would stay together and then in 2006 Melanie and Peter ended up going to a festival in Edinburgh and this was called the Edinburgh Fringe Festival and they camped and they went to a variety of shows and Melanie said this was one of the best times of her life and because they were so good together at this festival they were kissing and cuddling when they returned Melanie had so much hope for their relationship so the couple then returned home from Scotland on the 20th 27th of August and everything looked really good they were happy in the car they were talking to each other until they pulled into the driveway at home with all this happiness they got out of the car and they walked into the house but something was still brewing and Melanie could feel it between her and Peter but a couple days passed no one heard from Melanie and then on the 1st of September tragedy struck when Peter called Melanie's mom back in South Africa. Peter then gets on the phone with his mother-in-law and says that he woke up that night and he started walking around calling Melanie's name but she was not responding to any of his calls. Peter then walked downstairs to see what was happening and the rooms were just dark and everything was very quiet. When Peter went down the stairs to the living room that is when he saw his wife lying on the floor unconscious. Peter said that he tried to revive Melanie with CPR but nothing had worked. He then called the ambulance and the ambulance pronounced her dead on arrival at the hospital according to Peter. So Melanie's parents were obviously devastated by the news and they were then trying to talk to Peter and trying to discover what they need to do all the way from South Africa and kind of just arranging their flights and everything with Peter to go to the UK to see Melanie's body. But Peter was busy arranging everything with them but he kept insisting do not go to the morgue, you don't want to see Melanie's body, apparently the ambulance were very very rough when trying to resuscitate her and he just didn't want the parents to see her body in that way, he wanted them to remember her as the beautiful Melanie that he knew and they knew her as. When Melanie's parents arrived in the UK, Peter was incredibly cold with them and Melanie's mom would say that she felt bad for Peter so she didn't really push him to be more emotional. She just left him and thought that everyone grieves differently and this is just the way that he was grieving. And while Melanie's parents were in the UK as well, they kept saying we should go to the morgue, we should see her and Peter kept insisting that they do not go to the morgue, they do not want to see Melanie's body like that and while they kept having these discussions, Peter said that he got a call from the coroner to say that, that Melanie's death was caused by an aneurysm and Melanie's parents were obviously very very sad by this. She was so young and they had to accept that their daughter passed away from something that no one could really detect and Melanie's parents said that Peter from the get-go was constantly on the ball he was trying to arrange Melanie's funerals back in the UK and back in South Africa and he was doing everything for Melanie's parents as well. Peter also arranged a memorial service at the Thistle Hotel where Melanie worked and he arranged all the tables and the decorations and the food and quite a few people attended her memorial service at the Thistle Hotel but Melanie's parents still insisted that Melanie be laid to rest back home in South Africa and Peter agreed 100% he was was like sure no problem we should do this but he insisted that Melanie's mom pick out the urn and he said that please can the urn be blue because that was Melanie's favorite color. So while still in the UK Melanie's mom picked out the urn and her mom and dad and Peter then flew back home to Pretoria in South Africa. The three of them then headed off to Melanie's family farm where they would then hold the South African memorial service. And after the service was done a lot of people said that Peter was definitely to the point but he was very soft and very gentle and he also spoke about a poem that he had written for Melanie at her funeral. But once all the formal were done Melanie's mom and dad and also Peter then walked around the farm looking for a final resting place for Melanie and they put the urn on the ground and they put some flowers around the urn and as a last kind gesture I guess Peter then took off his wedding ring and he placed it inside her ashes and he then turned to Melanie's parents and he said this is a way that I could be with Melanie forever. I didn't really believe in heaven but I know now that I had heaven here with Melanie on earth. And this was very touching for Melanie's parents. They really enjoyed seeing Peter do this 
But Melanie's parents were obviously very distraught and they were crying and they were grieving the loss of their daughter. So once Melanie was laid to rest and all of Melanie's affairs were tied up back in South Africa, Peter then went back to the UK. And I'm not even joking, a couple of days after his feet landed on English soil, he then got back into his relationship with Emma Harrison. And Peter had told Emma before Melanie's death that they had separated and that Melanie had moved to London and that's why she was working so far away from him. But when she had passed away, he said that he had to take some time to sort out her affairs, but he would come back to her at the end. But Peter never ever told Melanie's parents that he was in a relationship with someone else. And I'm not surprised why. But he kept up this whole facade with Melanie's parents that he was a grieving widower and that he was constantly crying about Melanie, even though he never did it once at the funeral or anywhere in the parents' presence. And he would also write letters to Melanie's brother about how much he missed his wife. Peter also went to the Thistle Hotel to accept Melanie's last paycheck and to collect everything that she had there. Apparently, he showed someone her death certificate at the hotel. However, when Melanie's parents kept asking for her death certificate, he would make excuses about it and he would say that he would give it, he would get to it later and he would post it to them. But Melanie's parents also never pushed. They never kept asking, we need the death certificate, we need it. They kind of just would ask for it and then wait a couple of weeks because they knew that he was grieving about his wife. But eventually, Eventually, when some time had passed, Melanie's mom did approach Peter again and say, please, I actually need her death certificate. I need to tie up some other loose ends here in South Africa. Please, can you just pass it on? But then in 2007, Peter said that he would bring her death certificate back with him when he went to travel to South Africa to visit Melanie's parents. However, when Melanie's parents were getting ready to accept him in South Africa, he cancelled his trip in the UK at the last minute. And he said that he cancelled the trip because unfortunately his father back in Germany had suffered a heart attack. Then in 2008, Melanie's dad flew to the UK to try and get this death certificate from Peter. And when Melanie's dad, Petrus, arrived in the airport, Peter was supposed to meet him, but then he gets a text from Peter and then he said, oh no, I couldn't come to the airport because tragedy struck once again in Peter's life. And sadly, his mom back in Germany also suffered a stroke. And Melanie's family actually felt very, very bad for Peter because over the span of a couple of years, he lost his wife, his dad suffered a heart attack, and now his mom had a stroke. So they really felt bad for him because they didn't really think anything was very suspicious at all. And actually, Peter and Emma were still dating, but Emma started to get a little bit suspicious about Peter because she felt that he was lying about his parents being sick. And she just thought that something was off here and felt, mm, I'm kind of over this. And she decided then that she was going to end their relationship. And and Peter was kind of over it in a couple of weeks because Lilia, remember the girl from Malta who arrived a couple of years before, she had happened to come back and work at the Woodland Park Hotel and Peter and Lilia rekindled their relationship almost instantaneously. But then in March of 2007, Peter also had another relationship with a young lady named Rebecca. And Rebecca Jackson would say during her entire relationship with Peter that he would constantly use his wife's passing as a source of sympathy. And she was told by Peter that they need to take their relationship quite slowly because he was still grieving. He was married to his wife for six years and he needed to still process this and just kind of kiss me and cuddle me. That was kind of his whole thing with Rebecca. He just wanted the affection from her. But then Rebecca and Peter's relationship got incredibly serious quite quickly because Rebecca ended up falling pregnant. So now Peter had Lilia on the side, which he kind of ended things with. He was still talking to her, flirting, but his main focus was Rebecca now and the baby. So pregnant Rebecca and Peter then decided to move back into a house in Hamilton Avenue, where they could kind of raise their daughter together and they could be a family. But the day that Rebecca pulled up into Hamilton Avenue Drive, Peter then walked out and he said, actually, you can't move in today. I need to lock up the house because I need to travel back to Germany because my father just had a heart attack. So Rebecca tried to support him and she was like oh okay sure I will go back to the hotel whatever you need me to do and Peter was like thank you so much Rebecca thank you please respect me in this time yada yada and I kid you not a couple months after Peter had settled everything apparently in Germany from his father's heart attack they decided then to move back in together and literally a week before they were about to move in together he then said to Rebecca we can't move in I have to go to Germany because my mom suffered a stroke and I'm sure you kind of get from this point that none of this was true 
Peter's parents were happy and healthy back in Germany and they had no idea about the lies that their child was spinning back in the UK. Peter was never around for his daughter and he only saw her a couple of times before he completely cut ties with Rebecca and his daughter. And while Peter and Rebecca were actually trying to see each other, Rebecca was walking out of Peter's house one day when the neighbor called her over and the neighbor said to Rebecca, did you know that Peter is seeing another girl because she comes into the house when you leave? And Peter was clearly juggling too many things at once. His relationship with Rebecca had just dwindled and now he was single again, well, single, and his work was suffering he was stressed out at work he was not really focused on anything anymore and the guy was basically spiraling and in October of 2008 he was fired from his Woodlands Park chef job and at about the same time that Peter was fired from his Woodland Park hotel job Melanie's mom back in South Africa received a notification that she had a parking fine or something from Melanie's account and she noticed that Melanie's account had been alerted with this fine and she was absolutely furious that Peter had never changed the name on the car back in the UK. So Melanie's mom then called Peter and said, actually, you've had enough time now. It's time to hand over her death certificate so that I can move these accounts off of her name onto your name. And when Peter then dodged the request again from Melanie's mom, Melanie's mom had had enough and she then asked one of her friends who live in the UK to try and find out more information about Melanie's death. And what they found was rather unsettling because what the friend had found out about Melanie's passing was that no hospital, no morgue, no medical center ever registered Melanie's passing. And Melanie's mom thought this was incredibly strange, obviously, and she wanted to fly to the UK immediately to try and sort out what was wrong. But she was busy trying to organize everything with Peter, but by Christmas time in 2008, he had stopped answering any of her calls, and now Lilia, the lady from his hotel, had now moved into his house as well. So Lilia had now moved into Peter's Hamilton Avenue house, and she was trying to make everything her own. So she then went into the back garden, and she noticed this massive white cooler, and she wanted to open the cooler, but Peter shouted at her from a distance and he said, don't you ever go into that shed. Don't you ever touch that cooler. It's mine. And Lilia thought, okay, it's a bit strange, but you know, he's a chef. Maybe he keeps his good stash there. And she just left it alone and never asked any further questions. But remember, because Peter was fired from his Woodlands Park Hotel job, there was no money coming in. Lilia was doing odd jobs at the hotel, but there was not enough to pay for the rent, pay for the food, pay for their lifestyle. So the rent was not getting paid. And the landlord of this Hamilton Avenue hotel asked them all to leave the home. And the couple then decided, okay, they clearly have to leave. And they decided then to move to Malta to be with Lilia and her family. And apparently Peter was perfectly happy with this. But after they had all left the home in Hamilton Avenue, the landlord then went into the home a couple days after they had left. And he wanted to then check everything out. So on Saturday, the 6th of June, the landlord then walked into the home. He had a look at everything. Everything seemed fine. But then he went back out onto the pavement and he noticed that the wheelie bin was still out there. So he opened the lid of the wheelie bin and he moved over some trash and he noticed that there was a leg sticking out of the bin. So the landlord immediately calls police. The police then come over to the Hamilton Avenue home and they now start their investigation. So when police eventually opened this wheelie bin's lid and they were looking at the body, the police noticed that it was a female, but they couldn't identify any characteristics on her body at all. So police then had to look at dental records and that's when they realized that this was the body of Melanie. So an international alert was put out for the arrest of Peter Warner. So remember by this point Peter was living in Malta with Lilia and her family and all of them were busy sitting in the lounge watching TV when a news report came on the TV and it was Peter's face all over the UK report that he was now a suspect for murder of his ex-wife and he couldn't exactly avoid the fact that he now had to go to the UK and turn himself in. So Lilia and Peter then went to the UK to hand themselves in and because there was no evidence that that Lilia was connected. She was released and there were no charges faced against her. But Surrey police were very eager to hear what Peter Woolner had to say. And from the start, he was insisting that he never meant to kill Melanie. It was a mistake. He was defending himself. And he said that they got into a violent argument and it was four years ago and he couldn't remember because it was so long ago. But even though Peter Woolner's version of what happened that night when he murdered his wife didn't exactly add up, police were able to piece together what they suspected happened on the night that Melanie Woolner was killed. They believed that it was the exact night that they returned home from Scotland and Melanie was of high spirits but she could feel that something in the air was not right. Melanie and Peter were busy unpacking the car and while they were busy unpacking Melanie looked through Peter's phone and she uncovered some suggestive emails from a lady named Lilia. She was absolutely furious 
case that Peter and Lilia were still continuing their relationship, even though she moved back to Malta. The couple started arguing for a couple of hours, and eventually after the argument kind of dwindled down a little bit, Melanie then went to bed. Melanie was asleep upstairs. Peter then walked up the stairs quietly with a Le Creuset cast iron griddle. He then watched his wife sleeping in the bed and he then battered his wife to death with the griddle. He then noticed that a lot of blood was kind of pouring out of her face where he had hit her from. He then took a plastic Tesco bag, he wrapped her head around it and he then dragged her down the stairs out of the house. He then hosed her down outside and he took off her wedding ring. Peter then went to the car to retrieve Melanie's sleeping bag where he then placed her body into the sleeping bag and zipped her up. He then dragged Melanie in the sleeping bag into the shed in the back garden. And without any emotional change, Peter was completely calm throughout the entire situation. Apparently, he had then walked back into the kitchen. He washed his hands at the sink. He then walked back upstairs and he started washing the mattress where it was now blood soaked. He then tried to get as many blood stains out as he could. And there where he couldn't change the blood stains and make them disappear. He then used a fabric dye where the stains were too stubborn. And all of this occurred on the night before his 31st birthday and even though he was still talking to Lilia in Malta he just murdered his wife and she was in the shed in the back garden the day of his birthday he then went out with Emma Harrison to his favorite Italian restaurant and that is where he told Emma that his wife has now separated from him and that she had moved to London and I kid you not the day after he had murdered his wife and he had now gone out with Emma Harrison to the Italian restaurant, he then brought her back to his home, and they then had sex on the bed where he just had murdered his wife. Then after his birthday, he then went to Argo to then pick up a chest freezer, which he then dragged into his house, and he then placed Melanie into this chest freezer for three years. And I'm sure that Melanie's family would never ever think that this would ever happen, and that her body would never be discovered in someone's chest freezer in their backyard for three years. So the days before Melanie was reported dead, he then racked up £7,000 debt on her credit card, and he would go around spending all of her money, saying that she was in surgery, and that he had to buy the stuff for her. And once he knew that he had spent the money, and her body was safely locked away, in the chest freezer he then decided to inform Melanie's family about her aneurysm apparently and how she fell down the stairs and remember when they had the memorial service back in South Africa I told you that he wrote a poem and Melanie's mom thought back on the poem that he had written and that he had in her eulogy and she was reading it and she thought now this was incredibly suspicious the poem that he had written and I will now read you snippets from the poem from Melanie's funeral you brought me to trust you, you brought me to tears. In one tender touch, the pain disappears. I have been to the sword and seen it come, seen it die. As we enter the dark, I beseech you to try. In prophecy, all good things must end. So take care, my love, my friend. This yielding is fine, this promise rare. One day at a time, we've agreed to dare. Holding you tight with wide open arms, I'm letting you go, no stronger to harm. Go on, ride your way, do not break or bend. Just take care, my love, my friend. And we cannot exactly ignore the fact that, remember, he asked Melanie's mom to pick out a blue urn. And remember, he brought ashes to Pretoria back in South Africa, and he had put his wedding ring in these ashes. And Peter would later admit that those are ashes, they are real ashes, but they are just the ashes from his bride that he had a couple of days before flying to South Africa. And while all the memorial services were taking place at the Thistle Hotel back in South Africa, Melanie was lying in his chest freezer in his back garden undiscovered for three years. And with regards to the wheelie bin, when Peter and Lilia were ready to emigrate back to Malta, Peter then decided, okay, well, he can't just leave Melanie's body in the chest freezer. He has to do something. So what he did was he put Melanie's body into the wheelie bin. He then piled any home trash that he could on top of her body. And he thought that she just wouldn't be discovered which technically she wasn't for a couple of weeks. Basically in the UK, apparently, I don't know, I don't live there, but in the UK they have like metal arms that grab the bin and then pull it up into the main garbage area in the truck. And apparently if the bin is too heavy, the machine's arms don't pick up the bin, it just leaves the bin there. And then you kind of get the idea as a resident to know, okay, your bin's too heavy, lighten it up, and then next week we'll collect the lighter bin from you. So because Melanie's body was inside this bin, the machine that was going to pick up the bin registered that this thing was too heavy and so the machine didn't pick it up and just left it on the curb and because the dirt trucks and the bins aren't really handled by people they are handled by the machine 
no one really noticed to look into the bin to see why is it so heavy. And the wheelie bin had then sat out on the pavement for three weeks before the landlord had had a look inside the bin. And Peter's trial then began in June 2010. At the time, Peter was 35 years old and he was charged with the murder of his wife, Melanie Warner. His trial then took place at the Old Bailey in London and Peter pleaded not guilty to murder but guilty to manslaughter. And Peter really stuck to his story that there was an argument and he was just defending himself from Melanie and it was just an accident and he never meant to do it. According to Peter, they got into an argument because Melanie had discovered that Peter was still cheating on her and apparently Melanie grabbed the cast iron griddle and she was going to hit Peter with the griddle. And Peter then instinctively knew that this was going to be quite a sore hit and then he said instinctively that he grabbed the griddle and this is what he said in court, quote, The next thing I know, in a split second, I can remember grabbing for it, getting it off her and hitting her back in the middle of the face. She fell backwards and lay still on the mattress. There was lots of blood. I really don't know how long I stayed there for. There was no pulse. I believed she was dead. I remember running up and down the stairs pretty aimlessly. For a while, I lost the plot. I can't possibly put into words what went on. I've been thinking about these five minutes for the last five years and I can't work it out. And police were looking at this and they thought that this scenario that Peter had played could have been plausible. She could have tried to hit Peter with the griddle pan. She could have because she was angry and she was hurt. However, what they noticed when they took off the plastic bag off of Melanie's face was that she still had her eye mask on from when she had went to bed. So if she was trying to hit Andrew with the griddle pan, why was her sleeping mask on her face still? And the prosecution had found it incredibly weird that Peter had taken the time to take off her wedding ring, but he hadn't noticed that her sleeping mask was still on. But Peter's defense said that he had not removed the sleeping mask because a sign of respect for Melanie because she had passed away. But no one fell for it. And then on the 4th of June 2010, four years after brutally killing his wife, the jury returned a guilty verdict. Peter Walner was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 20 years. A lot of people said that as Peter left the courtroom, he showed absolutely no remorse. He was just stone-faced and just continued to walk as if it was an ordinary day. And it kind of begs the question, how could someone lie to everybody he apparently loved about murdering his wife? And was he so confident that he would never get caught that he just left her body on a wheelie bin in the middle of a pavement? Because Peter had gone to tremendous lengths to try and conceal his crimes, but then why did he just leave Melanie's body out in the public then? Was he looking to get caught? Or was he just so confident that he wouldn't get caught that he thought that this wheelie bin was just going to be taken by the council and that he would never have to face Melanie's death ever again? There was never any doubt as to who killed Melanie after she was discovered. And this was the man who had promised to love her and cherish her until death parted them. So that is the case of Melanie Woolner or the lady who was found in the wheelie bin in the United Kingdom. Let me know what you think about this case down below. I hope you have a great day further. Please stay safe out there. Thank you for all your love and support. I really appreciate every one of you and I'll see you again next week. Bye.